broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us and I'm your host Ben Crossman. As we get things kicked off here, we have a very, very special show planned for you today because not only are there a lot of different uh, stories to talk about later on in the segment, we have a great guest for you and you know, we had them on talking about their first line of products and happy to see them come out with a new, you know, uh, with a second iteration, a second generation. And, you know, this is going to be for Mac users, uh, you know, by and large. But this is, you know, this touches on something that I think is going to become a much bigger deal here in the next, you know, in the upcoming uh, years with, you know, obviously with all of the online cloud services, people like that getting compromised uh, left, right, and center. I mean, the idea of being able to store your files and make sure that you have access to them and, you know, only you, hey, that's a big deal. And to talk about the Apollo Cloud to, uh, I think it's called the Apollo Cloud to Duo. Uh, yeah, and, you know, we'll get all that. But yeah, joining us will be Justin Cleveland. He is the Director of Business Development for IoT for Promise Technology. And yeah, we'll get to them in just a moment. But before we do that, we should of course mention ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find anything and everything having to do with the show. Be it a link to our guest and any products that we talk about, any articles, videos, anything like that, we have you covered in the show notes. Just so if you're busy or you're preoccupied, don't worry, we have you covered. Also, be sure to check out the Computer America contest where, you know, every single Friday we give away a prize from Logitech. That's right. And we read, uh, you know, the winner's name live on the air and get their prize shipped out to them ASAP. And hey, it's just that simple. You too can be a winner. All you have to do is enter. And the last thing is, of course, the live video feed where you can watch Computer America and not just listen. Always a lot of fun and just another way to experience, hey, what it is that we do here? And, you know, you know, such on the video portion, we'll do things like show, you know, the guest website, products, demo videos. Uh, again, nothing mandatory. We are a radio program, but it's something a little extra. If you have time, hey, check it out. All right. So with uh, with all that said, why don't we introduce our guest one more time and get this underway? So joining us is Justin Cleveland. He is he is of course the director of business development for IoT or Internet of Things for Promise Technology. And Justin, thank you for joining us. Hey Ben, how you doing? Doing well, doing well, and of course, excited to talk about this today because, you know, this is a topic that we actually have a pretty good uh, segment coming up tomorrow about, you know, kind of cloud storage, the idea that you, you know, you are the master of your own data, and it's fortuitous that you're here to talk about your solution for it because, hey, you know, there, there are a lot of options on the market, and you offer, you know, one of the sleekest and, you know, uh, one of the best, so... Why don't we get a little bit of background on Promise Technology and a little bit of background on yourself? Okay, sounds good. So, yeah, Promise has been around for, I think, like about 30 years now. Um, they mostly play in more enterprise class storage racks and things like that. Um, they do have a, a very popular brand that's a Thunderbolt product called the Pegasus line. Um, it ranges from a 4-bay product up to an 8-bay product. Uh, sold through most retailers, Amazon, B&H, Apple, and a bunch of others. Uh, but it is more for like the media and entertainment business. Mm -hmm. um, and then the VTrack side, which is what they're known for, for the enterprise side, that's sold uh, mostly through a lot of different like VARs and things like that and into enterprise class, uh, you know, big storage data services and things. Uh, but And then they we started this other line that's the IoT side, which was the Apollo. We started with the Apollo 1, uh, launched it at CES two years ago, 
Um, it's done pretty well. You know, there's some competitors in the market, um, and uh, it's it's a new product, so people really need to kind of understand what's going on. Um, but to your point, it's all about managing your own data and managing it from wherever you are in the world at any time on any device. So it's really telling that story to get people to understand it. Um, and there's a lot of things built in. I mean, it's kind of like the Swiss Army knife of storage, right? You got um, access from anywhere, from any device, your iPad, your phone, your laptop. It works on Windows. It works on Android. It works on iOS and Mac OS. Mm -hmm. So you got every platform covered. Um, it also works uh, wherever you are in the world, as long as you have a data connection. So through your phone or whatnot, you can have access to all your content, which is a really cool thing. Most people don't really understand that a product like this exists. They're they're really stuck to the whole, you know, you need to plug in a hard drive in order to back up or or store data to it. So moving into these these new kind of you know hardware based cloud platforms um, is going to be where the market's headed. I think people are are leery with having their content in the cloud, as you mentioned before. You know, these big data service centers are starting to get hacked left and right. And it's just a matter of time before, you know, Dropbox loses all their data, you know, Amazon, um, iCloud, um, and there's, you know, Box and all those other guys. Um, they're big targets, right? They have a lot of data up there. And the, guy, the hackers are going to be the ones trying to hack that data all the time and get something that's beneficial to them. Right. Yeah. Whether when you have, a, when you have a, a personal cloud at your house and you control it, um, and you have just your content on it, hackers don't want to go after that. They're not going to go after that that mom and pop type um, solution. They want to go after something where they can get a lot of data all at one time. So that's where we kind of play into this mix. And, and we want to have people understand that, you know, this is, it truly is your personal cloud. It acts like a box or a Dropbox. You can have access to your data anywhere. Uh, you can transfer files. But ours is a little bit more because it's kind of like a your own social media server in a way because you can have up to 40 people per Apollo 2. Now, the Apollo 1 was interesting, but it only it only had up to 10 users. So when we add the redundancy of the extra hard drive in the Apollo 2, um, we gave it the ability to have up to 40 users. So this is really good when it when it comes to like small businesses, you know, your large, large home with a lot of people in it, or you want to share data. Um, small offices, home offices, and uh, give up to 40 people. Classrooms is another one that it appeals to. Um, classrooms are like 30 kids or so, plus a teacher and an admin. Um, and you can you can share that data and have each individual user have their own storage that's sandbox. So nobody else has access to it. They can't see your content unless you share it with them. Right. Um, so it makes it really interesting that way. Yeah. So, and you know, uh, just uh, just one real quick point. I mean, you said forty users. That is uh, pretty incredible. What constitutes a user? Is it uh, you know, uh, let's say if I have a tablet, a laptop, a smartphone, and a home computer, uh, am I four users, or is it kind of four uh, uh, forty uh, unique logins, passwords, things like that? Yeah, exactly. It's forty unique logins and passwords. So. Um, when you so if you had an account on my Apollo for say, um, you know it would be Ben. It would be your login, your password. When you log into that account, you're going to see just your data, or you're going to see data that I've shared with you. It may be a folder, it may be pictures, it may be just a couple files, PDFs or something. Um, and you would have full access to those. You can download them, you can you know comment on them and things like that. But it's really about your personal space, and you can do whatever you want. I can allocate, so out of a, a four terabyte system, I can give you anywhere from 100 megs to unlimited, right, which is, you know, four terabytes essentially. Um, and that's, that's a feature that people were asking for is they wanted to be able to share, but they didn't want to have people just take up, you know, gobs and gobs of their, their data on there and uh, use all their storage. So we made mm -hmm. it to where each single user, you can, you can allocate the, the uh, capacity for each user. That is super, super helpful. And, you know, hey, let's talk about use cases. You mentioned that great for, you know, kind of large homes and offices. Um, you know, can you kind of say in, you know, maybe your customers or, you know, kind of just in your using, is this great for people who like run? Because I actually saw your video. Um, I was kind of confused why on your website you linked to a video about Red Bull. And uh, but I believe he was like a graphic designer. 
And, you know, uh, it makes sense for like a graphic designer who wants to put his work for, you know, a specific client up on there. And then, you know, his, uh, you know, all of his different clients are kind of kept away from one another, but it's still centralized to him. Um, what are kind of the best use cases that you've found for the Apollo Cloud? Yeah, I mean, in the example of the Red Bull, that's more about the workflow, right? It's about somebody goes out and they're shooting content on their phone and they're de- they're uploading it immediately to an Apollo and they're sharing that, that content with their graphic designer or with their producer. Mm-hmm. And on the fly, he can download it, make the edits, push it back to the Apollo, and then send you the links back saying, hey, it's all done and you can go in and, and watch it. Uh, right there on the Apollo. That's kind of the whole premise around the Red Bull. Now, we've been talking to people like uh, law firms, small law firms, um, dentist office, small small dental type offices, and you know they can't really have any of their consumer data in a cloud service, especially law firms. Like, they're really tight. Yeah. Um, they can put some things out there, but you don't want any of those legal binding contracts and things out in a public cloud that can be taken or stolen because there might be IP or something around them, right? Or or data you just don't want out there in the market. So those guys are the ones that are using it the heaviest when it comes to businesses. Um, and they're sharing files just within their own law firm. Um, they're, they're sending files to clients for approvals or just for reviews and things like that. I got you. I got you. No. And, and that workflow is obviously super important. Um, and, you know, thank you for clarifying that. But uh, let's talk a bit more about, you know, kind of uh, and for anyone out there who's just listening to the radio portion, um, you know, maybe you should give them kind of an idea of what exactly is included with the Apollo. Like, how does the base unit look? And uh, are there any other, you know, kind of attachments? I know there's at least an app that goes with it. Yeah. And so, the, you know, we 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 took a look at the Apollo one and we did a complete redesign, right? We listened to our customers and what they really wanted was um, a device that had built in redundancy. So you have to go with a two drive system. So we made it as sleek as possible. It kind of looks like a, a time capsule, if you will, a little bit, it's kind of a little, little spiff off of that. Uh, But it has a lot more rounded edges and curves. And we put some design elements like the, uh, like the top where the fan is, um, you know, it has a nice little indent recess in the top. So, um, but it, you know, just for the people that, you know, want to get kind of a, a quick glimpse of what it might look like, it does kind of resemble kind of that white time capsule type look. It is a little bit larger than than a time capsule if you're comparing it to that directly. We did a lot of things uh, with the hardware. Everything was from the ground up. Um, software was rebuilt from the ground up. The app, if you look at it, is really the star of the show because that's going to be where we spend most of our improvements over time. Mm-hmm. Now that we have the hardware, the groundwork laid out, um, you know, has gigabit Ethernet, has the USB port on the back, which we can do things down the road to enable that um, and open that to an entire different kind of ecosystem. Um, but the app is really going to be where we spend that time and focus on, you know, getting feedback from people on UI, which we're doing daily. Um, and just really improving that process. Um, some of the other things that we did um, in the, the second version that the first version didn't have is uh, we have the ability to take all your photos from your, your library, and when you upload those to Apollo, before you, didn't ha- you couldn't really do anything with those other than view them, right? But now what Apollo does is it goes and looks through your face, your, all the face kind of separates them into a facial recognition bucket. So you would have to go through still and, and label each one, but once you upload more pictures over time, they're gonna fall into those natural buckets. Um, so, you know, you may have 10 people with with different faces and then you keep uploading and it's just gonna fill them um, and, and you'll label them, right? Your, your friend is Ben or your friend is Jim or Todd. Right. Um, every time you upload that picture, it's gonna go into that. Now, <laughs> now, and just a quick, I mean, is that, uh, is that technology that uh, you guys have been working on? Because, again, that sounds really similar to, you know, kind of Apple and their photos. I've noticed that they're starting to kind of do the same thing. Like, are you adapting their technology or is this something that you guys have to have developed? It's an in-house. See, you can't, Apple won't, won't release their APIs, but, um. Um, you know, we wanted to have basically the same functionality that you might have in app. Um, for example, like Google Photo or if, or, or if you're using iPhoto, uh, Apple's iPhoto, uh, we want to have the face, we build smart albums, and we also have uh, looks as well. So 
Um, all those are built into those solutions, but we wanted to put them into one place. So if you take your photos out of an iPhoto album and you upload them into another type of device, it loses all that data. You, don't, you can't take that over with you anywhere else. So we're basically recreating it and rebuilding it for you in our app just so you still have access to those things that you liked uh, in those other in, in-house solutions from Apple and, and Google. Right. And of course, the next, you know, the next place you have to take it, of course, is I think just the other day they announced that they now have facial recognition for uh, dogs. So obviously, you know, get to work on that. But in the meantime, you know, uh, the, the app, if you're watching the video portion, I mean, uh, kind of shows it in action here. Uh, seems to be a pretty basic drag and drop, um, you know, put different tags on it, things like that. I mean, the uh, and, and the thing I was going to ask you was. I think in a lot of people's cases, uh, especially, you know, kind of uh, small businesses and home users, they're never tied into just one ecosystem. They use, you know, Google calendars here. They use, uh, you know, uh, something else here. Like what other kind of integration have you done to, you know, kind of make this seamless with other environments? So the great thing is no matter what platform you're on, you're always going to get kind of the same experience or maybe little things that are different, but mm-hmm. um, it's, it's, that's what it's for, right? Is you, all your content lives in one location. So no matter what platform you're on, you're going to have the same experience getting at that data, sharing that data, commenting on that data, you know, adding friends to your network. Um, so, you know, we, we try to streamline it as much as possible so you don't get that different experience, but it's really about, you know, how does, how does the app interact with the person and then how is the person using the device? Because we found that a lot of people are using it in so many different ways, it was really hard to, to focus on, you know, what segment do we go after to market to? Right. Um, and then, you know, breaking it down to see, like, you know, a doctor's office uses it different than a, a law firm. It uses it different than a person that's just basically using it to, to store their photos on. Some people are using it just as a Dropbox solution and nothing else. Um, just because it's safe and secure. You did mention one thing, um, which is the drag and drop, which is a feature we just added. And that came out because of iOS 11. Uh, If you know the Files app on iOS 11, we were actually the first um, personal cloud device to offer drag and drop and using that service uh, within iOS 11 to store files. So uh, it's a really cool feature. If you're using it on iPad, definitely check it out. It's really awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, uh, we talked about some different use cases. Obviously, um, you know, you mentioned like Time Capsule for Apple, things like that, and Macs. Um, can this be used as a backup device, you know, as, a, as an external drive for uh, backups for different devices? Absolutely. With So with Time Machine staying in the Apple ecosystem, um, it is used as an SMB drive over the Internet. So you do have access to it anywhere in the world. You don't want to run a backup, your full backup of your time machine over the Internet. So you would do it locally first, and then if you're out there traveling and you have a, a connection, you can do incremental backups. But, yeah, you, you really don't want to do a, right. you know, a whole terabyte backup <laughs> over the Internet. It'll take forever. Um, and same thing on the, on the PC side. We don't offer um, the software for the PC to do the backup, but, I mean, there's plenty of – pieces of software out there that'll do it for you. As long as it can see that SMB target, you have the same features and functionality you would on a Mac. Very, very, and, and you're absolutely right about not wanting to do it over the internet. Uh, just for everyone out there, and when you do a complete backup, you know, that takes uh, hours, even on a solid connection through Thunderbolt, things like that. Um, speaking of that, how does this connect to, you know, to a network or your device? Uh, is it USB? Is it strictly Wi-Fi? How how does this connect to devices? So it is gigabit Ethernet on the back that you would connect to any router that has a you know an Ethernet connection and access to the internet. Um, and then when you do the when you do the the through the cloud connection through your phone or something when you're outside of your local network, it's basically just pinging the cloud service to say to phone home to find out where it is, and then it makes that peer-to-peer connection after that. So you're not really, nothing really is going through the internet, um, which there's a lot of other services out there that everything's going through a cloud service and then back down to you wherever you are using an iOS device or Android. Um, this really does create the peer-to-peer connection. So you, you are just getting that phone home connection once over the internet and then you're peer-to-peer after that. 
I got gotcha. you. And, and, and again, uh, sorry for just you know, scouring your website, but uh, a second Apollo Cloud, does that let you do anything if you have two of these devices, or is it strictly meant to be a single device, you know, kind of standalone? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a great feature that we've added. So um, with all these natural disasters that are going on, if you've been watching the news, and it's really sad. I mean, it's just, it's like one after the other, right? You got hurricanes and now fires, and it's getting a little crazy. So um, for disaster recovery, what we do is we can, you can sync one Apollo to the other and put them in different locations. So if you want to have one at, at your friend's house and then one at your house or one at a, you know, you have a, a second house somewhere else in the country, uh, you would just put one in, say, New York, one in L.A., and then they would sync up to each other. And if you're traveling to New York, you're going to get uh, all your content served from that one, so it'll be a little bit faster. And you're in L.A., obviously, you would get the content served from that unit, but they would be a direct mirror of each other. I got you. No, and that is super, super helpful. I mean, you're right between hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, fires. It's uh, it, We've seen story after story about people who have to pick up their, you know, pick up their lives. And in a lot of cases, they can't get back to their homes. And... It's weird, you know, time and time again, people say that the one thing that they miss, you know, you think it'd be everything that they paid the most for, but no, it's photos and family photos and, you know, things that you can't replicate. So uh, backup and offsite backup, huge, huge deal. Good to see that you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Fa family photos is like the number one thing you save if you have a box of them, right? But most people have digitized them. So, you know, you save your family photos that way. They're redundant somewhere else. And a lot of people, you know, they, they lose a lot of paperwork and documentation in natural disasters that, you know, some of that stuff is really important. So having it all saved in one space uh, is, is probably not the best thing to do. So having a redundancy offsite is kind of mandatory. Absolutely. So, and I, I think the device, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's meant to be simple. Uh, just looking at it, it seems like there's just, you know, the power button, um, not, you know, there's not like a touch screen or anything like that built into it. Um, you know, connect to it. I'm sure you discover the device on your Wi-Fi network, nothing too complicated, but it's meant to be simple. You know, you're not meant to be an IT professional to set this thing up. Um, so a lot, but like you said, a lot of the functionality does come from the app. Now the app, uh, only iPhone, I mean, we're talking Apple, but, uh, app, uh I'm assuming Apple and, uh, Android as well. Yes, correct. It's it's multi-platform. So we do have it on the, the iOS store. We have it on the Android store. Uh, we do have a download on our site for Windows. And then we have it on the, the Apple App Store for Mac as well. Right. And, you know, just talking about the app, I mean, uh, is... I mean, just kind of, is there any functionality that we haven't talked about? Because being able to see your, you know, see your files, share videos, things like that, all great and good. But um, let's say you're the administrator for your cloud. I mean, are you able to kind of do more administrative things through any device? Or is it like only one, one device is allowed to be the quote unquote administrator? So you have one admin account. So if you are the owner of the Apollo, you're the admin. You can you can add people, you can delete people. Um, you just can't see anybody else's files, but unless they've shared them with you, obviously. Um, and that's really the the only admin stuff you really need to have control of, other than you know scaling back how much capacity people are using and things like that. But um, and doing updates to the the firmware and stuff like that. You you really don't need to have too much um, control of it. It's it kind of it does its own thing. You don't really, you're just, you're kind of an owner, you're kind yeah. of a user at the same time and just kind of manage it that way. Okay. And I think a good place to go next with this conversation would be, you know, kind of the more just kind of technical stuff. Uh, how long, I'm sorry, how much storage do you get, uh, you know, through this? Uh, do you have options or um, I'm seeing here eight terabytes? Yeah. So it's eight terabytes. Now that would be configured in a RAID zero. So we, we give you the option to, when you first time set up as an owner, uh, you can configure it in RAID 0 or RAID 1. Um, so you would have full capacity in a RAID 0 setup, but remember it's not redundant, so you're not going to have any protection. You would have about 8 terabytes um, if you did it in that config. Now if you did a RAID 1, you're gonna, obviously going to get 4 terabytes of space, and then you're going to use the other drive as, as redundancy. 
I gotcha. And, you know, talk a bit about the price of this because, you know, hard drives, they, uh, the price of memory has been coming down, but at the same time, you know, it's, uh, it, it's more affordable, but I feel like it's still like the price in a lot of people's minds is the reason they don't make backups because they think they're expensive. Yeah, so if you're looking at, at price competitiveness, we're definitely going to be more expensive than, you know, a regular USB device, but we're also offering a lot more. So you have the two drives in there, um, you have a larger enclosure, we have a capacitive touch button, you know, you start adding all these things. We are using a dual core processor. Most hard drives aren't using any kind of processor to do any kind of intelligent thinking. Um, so when you start adding all that up, it does get expensive. So it is 449 mm-hmm. um, for the unit for the eight terabyte. Uh, we do offer the the Gen One still, um, and that's 199 and 249. Um, but this is definitely a, a huge improvement and step up. And you have to think about, you know, what are you spending right now for cloud storage? If you're a business and and you have 10 people using a, a Dropbox type solution, you can be spending a thousand dollars a year easily for having half the capacity you would have for an Apollo. So, you know, small businesses, getting them to understand that. And then, you know, you don't really have control of your data. Somebody else is storing your data for you and you don't even know where it is or what country it's in, right? So right. that's another piece of it. It could get hacked. Um, so for the for the value and you break it down of what you're getting, it really is a good value. Right. And yeah, and honestly, I don't know. I, I really don't know the reason. I don't know if it has to do with security or other factors. But the cost of cloud storage has gone up a, a ton in the past couple months, um, you know, through providers such as Amazon, Google, what have you. I mean, the, the simple cost of it, uh, four terabytes, what you're buying is, uh, you know, going to pay for itself very, very quickly. So I think with that, I mean, you know, let's talk about kind of where you hope to see the Apollo, you know, the, the Apollo Cloud 2 Duo. Um, obviously, you said that a lot of your ongoing work, I mean, hard drives are hard drives. Uh, there's not a lot of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, work you need to do there. But you said that a lot of your development is going to focus on the app. Are there any features you're excited about, you know, upcoming? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're, you know, we're currently working on a, another release that's going to be coming out. Um, I can't go into specifics about it, but, you know, we are trying to make this uh, more of your your IoT type solution and be more of a, a member of your your household, right, and do things that uh, you may not think a hard drive would do or, or, or assist you with. You know, there's always, you know, integration coming with uh, other, you know, large name devices out there. And uh, it's going to be interesting what this shapes up to be over time, um, you know, what our competitors do. But, you know, we definitely have a roadmap, and it's very solid and very focused on what we're trying to do. You know, adding integration with uh, with other devices that you may already have in your house mm-hmm. uh, that you may not really think about would make a lot of sense. But when you actually view it kind of long term, it really makes sense in tying all this stuff together. Because right now, if you look at the market, you have all these devices, but nothing is utilizing storage. They're all going to the cloud in some way, shape, or form, and they're storing your data somewhere. Um, but, you know, again, taking control of that data and then what can you do with that data locally that you can't do in the cloud or with multiple devices that, you know, one thing is stored in this cloud, one thing stored in this cloud, and they don't talk to each other. So, you know, you can see I like think, long term. Yeah. And, and, and just real quick, I mean, I think that's by design, though, because a lot of these uh, Internet of things that you're talking about, I mean, you know, let's just take things like security, uh, you know, home security footage, for example, that's part of their revenue model because you know they they don't sell their their webcams and things like that for you know much of a gain and then they hope to make it back over time with memberships with you know pay us x amount of money for you know 24 hours of video storage on our cloud service you know like i feel like you know data storage is part of their revenue so they want you to spend more on you know like they don't want to have built-in memory they want you to pay more for cloud storage Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But you look at, you know, looking at their plans and I've, I've obviously done all the analysis on these guys, you know, they offer anywhere from no days of storage to two days for free. And then it always goes up to like, you know, 30 days at at 10 bucks a month. Right. But again, you know, you're trying to, you're trying not to spend as much for these services because then you start getting 
You're paying for iCloud, you're paying for Box, you're paying for Dropbox, you're paying for all these bits and pieces all over the place. And it's just better to have one solution you can you know, direct all your traffic to and store it all in one place. I don't want to have to go to 10 different and apps and see uh, what's going on. And Justin, uh, would you mind staying over for just a minute so we can give this a proper send off? Yep, no problem. Uh, perfect. So everyone, uh, music means we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Computer America, Promise Technology. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 31 minutes past the hour. And, you know, hey, we have uh, just a few more things to ask our guest here, who is, of course, Promise Technology, Mr. Justin Cleveland. And he is the Director of Business Development for IoT. And actually, that job title is why I kind of asked Justin to stay over because I know that you said you can't comment too much on it, but um, you know I'm, I'm I'm getting pretty good at this. Obviously, uh, you know you don't have to confirm or deny anything, but I will say that uh, you know kind of looking at your device, we were talking about the fact that you know you're right. A lot of these devices have their own ecosystems, and you can access them from a variety of platforms, but uh, actually integrating them uh, one to the next. Uh, there seems to be a lacking central hub, and I, you know, completely assume that you know, pro, you know, promise, and the fact that this uh, cloud, you know, the Apollo Cloud Two Duo, it's in a pretty good position to store a lot of data and to access other devices through it, because hey, you know, it can, you know, kind of store that data. Um, I'm assuming that uh, Apple is coming out with their Apple Home Kit or, or the uh, the home automation. Kind of like Alexa and uh, and Google Home, things like that. Um, are you going to see any kind of interplay? Uh, you know, just kind of not really developing, you know, a home security system yourself, but bringing, you know, kind of home automation with Internet of Thing with, uh, you know, home security. Are you hoping to kind of be that hub, be that central piece? Yeah, I think we want to we want to play our part as the storage piece of that. How how that plays out. You mentioned HomeKit. You know, we're definitely working on that. Uh, there is no profile right now for storage through Apple uh, to support HomeKit, but you know, we're definitely wanting to be there, right? That's where we want to be. What you mentioned is exactly what we want to play into long term, and I think it's uh, you know, it's no one thinks of storage in that piece really. So when you kind of add storage to it, it opens the the doors to a lot of different things for us and and for the user as well. Um, no one to, thinks to of it. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, no one thinks of it because they think that cloud that cloud storage is the answer, or they think that you know uh, having Amazon or Google or Microsoft, they think that having them keep all you know, everyone's data for everything is the best solution. And obviously, you guys don't think so. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. But the thing is, that your data is in all these different places, all over the place, using all these different cloud service providers. You know, putting all that content into one where you control it and, you know, you're, you're mitigating your risk, the, the least amount of content you have out there and you have it on your own personal cloud, you know, you're not going to have as, as risky of your, your credit card information or your important documents getting out there, um, someone and, stealing your identity. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, and the last point I wanted to kind of ask you was I've, uh, you know, I, I've been using this product, uh, you know, quite a bit lately. It's really made my life simple, but um, not not paid by them or anything. But uh, there's a service out there called Plex. It's used in a lot of network attached storage devices. It's uh, pretty darn handy. Do you have software that, you know, either could replace Plex for certain people? Because I know that, you know, for their network attached storage, 
it is a prime use case or would Plex, you know, could you kind of give Plex its own username and give it a part of, Apollo, you know, the Apollo Cloud? Yeah, so we're we're definitely looking at Plex. Um, it's it's kind of on our our roadmap. You know, what does that look like? How is it integrated? How are people going to use it? Um, you know, I've definitely done my homework on, on Plex. It is an interesting concept. Uh, it's you know, it's something that we're looking at. Um, I can't tell you when or if, but right. you know, I can tell you it's definitely something we're taking a look at, a hard, okay. serious look at. Um, you know, someday it could be integrated into Apollo and you would have a, you know, Apollo would be your Plex server and you would just run the Plex app and have all your content uh, aggregated on there. Right. Yeah. I, I'm not even saying that you have to integrate Plex. I'm just saying that the functionality of something like Plex, uh, super helpful. And obviously I think a lot of people find a lot of use out of it. So maybe not even Plex, but you know, a service similar to Plex, but of course I'm sure I'm getting too blue sky here. And Justin, I'm going to say, um, you know, did we miss anything about uh, about this device? And if we haven't, where can people go to find out more? Uh, you can go to our website, uh, promise.com, and then click the link to Apollo. Um, I don't think we really missed anything. You know, thanks for having me back. Um, it's interesting to talk about a, a new product that's uh, new, revolutionary, and we're, we're headed definitely in the right direction and breaking ground with the stuff we're trying to do. Um, back to the, the Plex comment really quick. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can play all your com your, your uh, movies and MP3s and all your videos and stuff already on it using our, um, our app. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but if, yeah. And if you do want to stream to a TV um, and you have Apple TV, you can actually stream through your device, uh, basically from the Apollo to your device, your iOS device, to an Apple TV. It's not exactly like Plex, but you, you can stream to a TV today all your content from your Apollo. Right, yeah, definitely uh, definitely a good point to make. Didn't want to make it sound like you couldn't uh, view content on many, many different devices. So, uh, But no, great comment, and uh, available where? Uh, so it's available uh, today on Amazon. It's in Apple retail stores. We're, uh, we're going to be opening the channel. I think B&H just, uh, just took it on. Um, obviously, direct, you can order it directly through us. And we're going to be uh, going through a lot more channels in the next probably 30 to 60 days for sure. I gotcha, I gotcha. So everyone, again, we have a link to this in the show notes as well as the product and promise.com. But uh, but yeah, Justin, uh, again, th thank you for coming on again. And I can't wait to, I don't know, maybe Cloud cloud 3 Duo or th uh, 3 Trio or something. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> lo looking forward to the next product as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Maybe another six months, we'll have to follow up and we'll have a lot of new stuff for you. That sounds like fun. All right. And in the meantime, everyone, go check it out. And Justin, have a great day. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Ben. Bye-bye. Talk to you later. Bye. All right, everyone. And there he goes. So we're going to go ahead and move on into computer and technology news. That's right. And, you know, this is a segment dedicated to all things computer and technology related, where you know, hey, this is uh, the latest news, hacking news, uh, which seems to be overabundant lately, uh, product, policy, things like that. Hey, it's always a lot of fun. So why don't we go ahead and jump into that? Here we go. All right, all right. So how about we do our first story and... You know, this is going to be a little bit blue sky, I think, but it's the start of an initiative. And I really like these stories because they show the potential of technology. And it's going to take a long time for technology to ever get to the point where what we see being tested is, you know, kind of widely developed and widely available to all. But it's still exciting to see what's coming in the future. And I think a good example of this will be this article from Engadget and where Mr. Timothy Sapala. Yeah, and you know, this is actually coming out saying that the Alphabet's Sidewalk Labs is building an internet city in Toronto. Obviously, they're not starting from the ground up. Toronto's a very well uh, established city, but looks like they're gonna be putting some uh, some technology into it. So they said that the next step for Alphabet Sidewalk Labs is to make a 2,000 acre smart neighborhood in Toronto, where Google Canada will relocate its headquarters to the newly created Quayside neighborhood along the eastern waterfront 
to serve as an anchor for the area and will invest some $50 million in the first phase of planning and project testing. And that is, of course, according to a press release. So the entire project costs about a billion, a billion with a B, a billion dollars. And they said that, and they said that TechCrunch writes that an additional 1.25 billion will come from Toronto itself. So obviously, hey, you know, incentives have to be made. But they said that uh, the Prime Minister of Canada said that the move is to make for smarter, greener, more inclusive cities that he hopes will expand across Toronto and eventually the globe. You know, when I think about things that take over the world, uh, thriller, um, movies, you know, just aliens that land in Japan, like, I think about things that take over the world, Toronto isn't usually the epicenter, but I digress. So, they said that the plan is to revamp transportation and infrastructure, create affordable housing opportunities, and establish clear governance policies related to data protection and privacy. And I think that's a huge part of it. So, Sidewalk will do so by implementing autonomous transit lines, climate positive energy systems with an eye towards sustainability and to ensure Toronto residents have a say in how Quayside is built. They will be, uh, I'm sorry, there will be a series of town hall meetings starting November 1st. So if you're in Toronto and you're in this area, pretty, uh, pretty nifty. And given that Toronto's tech and startup scene, it's any, uh, it's any wonder why Google picked the, uh, the Canadian city from a sea of proposals. I think what they're saying is that, uh, yeah, well, it, it, it's probably a typo. It's probably, it's not any wonder. Uh, but yeah, no, Toronto, very established, very mainstream kind of city. Uh, don't doubt their relevance in the tech and startup industry. But I do like the fact that they are going to be tackling some, as they put it, uh, policies related to data protection and privacy. Now, when you do smart cities and, you know, uh, cities that are autonomous or they have, uh, you know, capabilities beyond just your average, you know, police sitting on a street corner or, uh, you know, maybe traffic cameras, things like that. That's one thing. But I have a strong feeling that Google is going to be instead making the city towards the you know towards how can we not only make this a better place to live because hey you know if it's not an enjoyable place to live then what the heck is the point of living there but they're also going to be how do we make cities either more efficient to run how do we make them more profitable or how do we make them you know just better for all parties involved because cities of the future are not going to be built on the rubble of collapsed, you know, Googles and Alphabets and Amazons. They're going to be built, and they're going to be built with you know, kind of those companies in mind. So, I don't know if this means that they're going to be monitoring people's uh, walking habits, traffic habits, uh, public transit use. I don't know if this means that they're going to be monitoring all the energy use going in and out of a home all water use coming in and out of the home. Like, I don't know if these are going, if this neighborhood is going to be some sort of super surveilled uh, data mining city, or at least, you know, kind of neighborhood. But obviously they're going to try to tackle that issue of how much do you monitor and track and hopefully see trends in the data and how much is it invading people's privacy? So, That might be a big part of what this neighborhood really ends up being, is how far can you go before people say that's too much? Because I think for, you know, hey, let's face it, for your ordinary person, uh, your internet, your television habits, your, uh, you know, your your, your electricity usage, things like that, uh, to some extent are all being monitored, but with the advent of the internet of things, hey, it can get there to an even greater degree. And yeah, this is, this is, this is going to be exciting to see when it actually happens. Now, obviously uh, it's going to start happening $50 million to begin with and about $2.25 billion in total. This is obviously going to happen over a couple of years. 
but we'll see what happens indeed. All right. So with uh, with that being said, you know, hey, I, I, I did, really did like that story. How about we do this one? So this is a story about a company that I don't know their future, which is a shame because I really do enjoy their products. They've been friends of the show, as have their peers. And I'm talking about Garmin. And I'm talking about Garmin. I'm also, by extension, speaking towards TomTom, towards Magellan, really any, any of these GPS, uh, you know, kind of standalone GPS devices. They were huge, and they definitely had their time to shine. And then smartphones came along, and they kind of took the same uh, functionality, and they overlapped and started to cannibalize what they were. Well, it looks like one company is striking back and trying to be a little bit more uh, interconnected than it used to be. So this coming to us from Engadget, Ms. Mariella Moon, and saying that Garmin, uh, Garmin Speak, that's the name of the product, Garmin Speak, puts Amazon Alexa in your car and is now available for $150. Not holding out hope, but it shows that they're trying to innovate in some way, which is something, which is something. So here we go. Garmin's GPS device uh, devices already feature voice control, but if you'd prefer to have Alexa on board, its latest product is more your jam. And the GPS device maker has just released Garmin Speak which it says is the first in-vehicle device with hands-free access to Alexa. It's a tiny little thing measuring just around an inch and a half with an LED ring light and an OLED display that shows turn-by-turn -turn directions. All right. And you can talk to the voice assistant through its, uh, I'm sorry, through uh, the same way you talk to Alexa through Echo. Just say Alexa and follow it up with a voice command. Where, if you need to say directions, you say Alexa, ask Garmin to route me to, and then, hey, save the address to where you're going. And the voice assistant will add items to your grocery list through speak, uh, play music, or read an audiobook through your car's speakers. Again, functionality that uh, I think smartphones largely can do about the same thing. Of course, uh, you know, the added benefit of Alexa that's, uh, you know, a little bit better, I suppose. At any rate, they said that simply speaking, anything Alexa can do for you at home, it can do in your car. And they said that uh, Amazon Alexa VP of automotive, uh, I'm sorry, or automotive Ned Keurig said in a statement, saying that our vision is that our devices will be everywhere our customers want it, including inside the car. This is obviously talking about Amazon products. And Alexa on the Garmin Speak can help customers with many things like controlling their smart home from the road, getting news or traffic, listening to audiobooks, adding items to shopping lists, and ordering dinner with just their voice. So, at any rate, the Garmin Speak is now available through Amazon, Best Buy, and other retailers for $150 bucks, and around the same price as some of, the other, as some of Garmin's other in-car models. As much as I like this, and it's much more sleek, much more minimalist, uh, it's not bad. Definitely a fan of voice control, but at the same time, man, Garmin and the other GPS companies must be feeling the pinch from, hey, you know, smartphones. We'll see what they come up with, though, because I think Garmin, you know, Garmin Speak is a good step but it's going to have to be a lot more robust to start to outcompete the smartphone. At any rate, why don't we go ahead and move on to our next story? And we have a couple of them here. How about we do... All right. <laughs> I'm having an optimistic kind of day. I, I like these stories because they show that there's progress being made in certain fields. And this next one has to do with General Motors. Right, car company. 
This is coming from Gadget, uh, Ms. Mallory Locklear, and saying that GM aims to be the first to test self-driving cars in New York City. Of all the places, you know, we've heard uh, Arizona and how in their uh, multitude of empty highways, uh, you can test self-driving cars. That's great. That's perfect. We've heard on close test tracks in California. Okay, great. Um, but getting self-driving cars, cars with no drivers whatsoever, getting that more into the mainstream's, you know, kind of thought process, that's going to take some real visibility. And I can think of no better place than New York City. Heck, that place is built on top of each other, like sardines. So when you put something there, people are going to notice. So they said that it looks like New York City will be hosting its first test of fully autonomous vehicles very soon. And surprisingly, they're not from Waymo, from Waymo or Uber. So Waymo is the division off of Alphabet, i.e. off of Google, that has their self-driving car, Uber, you know, has their own division. And uh, yeah, you know, both are working on autonomous vehicles, but looks like General Motors and Cruise Automation have submitted the first application for sustained testing and are aiming to do so in Manhattan. Yeah, you could be bet that a place such as Manhattan is where this stuff is really gonna shine, where these vehicles can operate, again, as long as they are fueled and maintained there's probably going to be a demand for them 24-7. So, New York State only recently opened its roads up to self-driving vehicles, joining California, Arizona, and Pennsylvania in allowing tests of the technology. And they said that, and the governor of New York announced in May that the DMV had begun taking applications from said test in New York roads, and GM is the first in line. And in order to be approved, companies like GM will have to cover each vehicle Wow. If you thought your insurance was high, imagine what GM is shelling out for this. Each vehicle has to be covered with a $5 million insurance policy. Obviously, they don't have to pay $5 million per car, but I digress. You know, hey, it's, it's going to be a lot of money to insure these things. And reimburse state police for any costs that come with overseeing the test and keep a person in the driver's seat at all times. Recently, California did away with that rule. California DMV, I think like a week ago, did away with that rule, but New York still has it. So they said that there are also some limitations on where the test can take place, where they can't be conducted near a school or a construction zone, for example. No construction zone. That is like everywhere. Whatever. So Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer said in a statement that New York is the ultimate proving ground for autonomous vehicle technology. We have a streetscape that is unrivaled in its scale and complexity, and so it's fitting that General Motors and Cruise Automation are finally bringing this technology here for testing and development. Complexity, you know, you can kind of argue with that. I mean, heck, it's a grid. It's not like it's some weird ancient, uh, you know, some kind of alien kind of technology. Folks, it's a grid. It, it, it makes sense. But I will say that there's probably a lot of jaywalkers. There's probably a lot of uh, pedestrians and, you know, little things that you have to pick up on. So, yeah, excited to see what autonomous cars can do. And GM, uh, GM's and cruise automation tests will be performed with an engineer behind the wheel and a second person in the passenger seat in a geofence area of Manhattan and that they're expected to begin in early 2018. So, if you're in Manhattan, if you are in New York, and you see a cruise, lo a cruise branded vehicle, yeah, that's an autonomous car happening right in front of your eyes. Can't wait to see it. All right, I think that leaves time for just one more story, and we have a couple that we're not going to be able to get to, but let's do something uh, important. Something important. All right, Pizza Hut. That's important. That's important to a lot of people. That's important to me. So Pizza Hut, for those of you who do not know, yeah, seems dropping, whatever. So yeah, Pizza, pizza Hut, for you, who, those who don't know, 
they've been hacked. They've been compromised. You know, just talking about security in the first part of the show. Well, Pizza Hut has gotten hacked. And here's the worst part. They waited two weeks to tell their customers. That is not the proper approach to, yeah, uh, account security. And they said that customers who saw their credit card details used fraudulently in the last couple of weeks are understandably angry. So this is coming to us from, uh, from PC Mac, Mr. Matthew Humphreys. And they said that Pizza is facing a lot of angry customers this week after it waited two weeks to inform them of a security breach and that anyone placing an order on the U.S. using the company's website or mobile app uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, between October 1st and 2nd may have had their credit card details stolen. And they said that Pizza sent out an email to customers yesterday, October 14th, informing them of the breach and that the company cl uh, classed it as a temporary security intrusion. That means, obviously, after you know October 1st or 2nd, it was no longer uh, happening. But during those, uh, you know, during those two days, yeah, compromise. So if the information stolen includes card names, delivery addresses, email addresses, payment card information, including the number, expiration date, and the CVV number. Folks, if you are the if you are if you order Pizza Hut between October 1st and 2nd, online, of course, might just be time to get a new card before the worst can happen to you. So some customers are now reporting their credit cards have been used fraudulently. And presumably, if Pizza Hut had informed customers of the breach immediately, actions could have been taken to cancel the cards and avoid the fraud. Again, not a good look for Pizza Hut. And as to the impact of the security breach, Pizza Hut believes that less than 1% of the visits were affected. Apparently, that turns out... Oh, actually, yep, yeah, sorry about that, folks. There we go. Autoplay ads are great. And they said that uh, apparently that turns out to be about 60,000 individuals across the U.S. That's a lot of people. And here's the worst part. Pizza Hut has not yet revealed why it happened or how it happened. And suggestions that the full extent of the breach took time to uncover or that law enforcement delayed the announcement need clarifying. Obviously, Pizza Hut just, they didn't mess this one up. But they didn't help with the recovery aspect of this whole thing, you know? So at any rate, there you have it. Pizza Hut, if you order, you know, if you order from them again between October 1st and 2nd, hey, your card may have been compromised. All right. So, yeah, and some of the stories that we are not going to be able to get to that you can find over at Computer America... Uh, Intel had a new series of processors that they were uh, unleashing. They are not for consumers. They are for uh, artificial intelligence, and they are optimized for exactly that point. Uh, some others include Netflix and how they are going to be spending $8 billion on original content this year. Now, last year, they spent $6 billion, and this year, $8 billion. And if you recall, they had a price hike here a couple of months ago for their most expensive tiers, and that will be paying most of, of the difference between, you know, uh, six and eight billion dollars. So eight billion, eight billion dollars is coming from Netflix in terms of original shows, movies, and anime. Uh, and then the last one that we really didn't get to that I really wanted to was the fact that Qualcomm was able to get the first 5G mobile net connection uh, stable. And get this, it was able to achieve one gigabit per second internet speeds. That's, that's probably better than what you have at home. And they're able to get that over a phone. It's exciting. Can't wait for it to come. And yeah, 2019, that's when they said it, it was going to be here. So folks, music means that we're out of time. Thank you for joining us here on Computer America. If you enjoyed any part of today, hey, check us out Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. Be sure to check out ComputerAmerica.com where you'll find show notes, uh, giveaways, articles, and more over at our website. And be sure to tune in tomorrow as we talk with Darius Derek Shani, and it's going to be all about storage. 
That's right, kind of like what we talked about today, but uh, giving you a full breadth of your options. So check it out, Darius Derek Shani. He's our graphics uh, correspondent and just all together great guy. So in the meantime, everyone, have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.